Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday to you. And uh, thanks for joining us back with us today. We're in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we do this every morning. Um, where we dive into the scripture together just to encourage one another and uh, try to gain some insight from what um, the Lord might be teaching us and leading us toward. Um, we have been, over the last couple of weeks, walking through the Gospel of Matthew, kind of verse by verse, uh, looking at the, the story of Jesus' ministry and his miracles that he has performed, his teachings, and um, we are in Matthew chapter 5 today. We're going to try and wrap up chapter 5 today. Um, and so we'll dive into that. Just uh, wanted to encourage you to be praying. Uh, tonight we have a um, we have another meeting with um, uh, the people up in Paisley, um, the Paisley Association. We're in cooperation and work partnership with Paisley Association as well as Spring Creek Charter School on doing some ministry in that area and uh, coming alongside of families just to be an encouragement and a blessing to them. We're uh, putting the fine uh, details together on the back to school event that we're going to be helping with. And so um, we have a meeting tonight up there. So be in prayer about that with our team that's going up uh, to meet with them and uh, looking forward to seeing how that uh, plays out and um, what that means for us in ministry. So uh, please be in prayer about that tonight. Um, but I want to jump back into Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Jesus in Matthew 5 is giving us this kind of uh, snapshot of what the kingdom of heaven looks like, what the kingdom of God looks like. And when we think kingdom of God, I think it's important we don't think just like kingdom of God, like eternal kingdom, like heaven. Uh, that's part of the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God, the reign of God is now. Uh, the reign of God is established on earth. And so we are living in the kingdom of God right now. Um, and being in relationship with God, being in fellowship with God means we live different. We're, we are uh, organized different. We are motivated differently. We are called to live uh, completely different than the rest of the world. And so Jesus is giving us uh, this lesson in this scripture here of this idea of this is how the world lives. This is how I want you to live. Um, this is what you've been taught long ago. Um, but I want you to I want you to know the deeper meanings of this, and uh, and so everything that Jesus is calling us to in Matthew's gospel here is to be so different than the rest of the world, and that's really what the name of the church means. The church, the word for church in um, in this uh, the word for church in the scripture is um, ecclesia. Ecclesia means called out. It means different than the rest of the world, opposite of the world. And so, um, and so we are called to be that. And so he's given us ideas of how to do that. So let's just read uh, today in verse 38 um, what he, sell, he tells us here. He says, uh, he says, you have heard that it was said. He's been saying that all along. You have heard that it was said, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Uh, this is an interesting scripture. This uh, scripture is rooted in Old Testament scripture. And, and in many cultures, especially ancient cultures, uh, this was a, a, a law that was... Uh, recognized. Uh, it was kind of a common law of the Old Testament times, a common law of, of ancient um, of ancient civilizations. It's even in many places still law. Uh, and it governs our stuff as well. It governs even our laws in our world today. And the law is that, uh, the overarching law is that when wrong has done, reparation needs to be taken, has, has to be taken place. Uh, that if you hurt someone, you should be hurt. There should be a penalty. There should be consequences for that. Um, this was kind of a uh, a law known for uh, known as tit for tat, right? That that if you do this, the same will be done to you. If you maim someone, you should be maimed. Um, is the eye for the eye, eye for an eye kind of law that was 
in Old Testament law. And sometimes we kind of push back against that a little bit, like uh, that's barbaric and stuff like that. But actually, it wasn't. Actually, the 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 beautiful thing of the eye for an eye law was that it was under um, it was under legislation. It was under control. Um, the eye for an eye thing was not a vigilante justice, right? That's not what the law of God said uh, in Old Testament times. It wasn't like, hey, if my neighbor comes over here and hurts me, I get the opportunity to go over to my neighbor's house and I can hurt him. That's not how that law worked, right? That's That would be chaos if we had that. Uh, but the eye for an eye was always under the jurisdiction of the legal system. It was always under the um, direction of a judge, uh, and there were executioners that would carry that out. So if, yes, if you murdered someone, um, if you murdered someone and uh, you, the family members couldn't go and, and seek revenge on that person and murder that person, it had to go through the court system. Uh, if you stole from someone, you couldn't just go steal from them, it had to go through the court system. So there's, 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 there's some good things about that law. It also restricted excessive force as well, right? That if we left it up to just a person to uh, to seek out justice, we would carry it way too far, right? If you stole something from me, man, I, I might be willing to steal more than what was due my, um, my reparation. So is, there's some good things in that. But Jesus in this text here is giving us this idea there that it is not our responsibility to go and seek retaliation. We don't need to retaliate against people. Um, there needs to be a, 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 an aspect of grace. There needs to be an aspect of mercy with us that, that because God has given us grace and because God has given us mercy, we need to not look in our world to seek justice. Or not, not, not so much justice. Justice is a good thing. Not to seek revenge. Not to seek... Um, uh, vengeance on someone. So when someone wrongs us, it's not our job to go and punish them, right? God's not saying be a doormat. He's not saying be a, taken advantage of. He's saying, let's be gracious people. Let's be different than the rest of the world. The world looks to, to retaliate. The world looks for revenge. The lo world looks to seek vengeance, right? We need to be people of grace. He goes a little bit even further in verse 43. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus gives another interesting challenge here. He says, uh, you have heard that it said, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The interesting part is when you look back at that scripture, uh, the first part of that is an accurate statement. That in the Old Testament, it says love your neighbor, but nowhere in the scripture does God ever tell us to hate our enemy. He doesn't do that. Uh, <clears throat> that was kind of a, a thought they had in those days. But Jesus ups Annie here. Jesus says, not only are we to love our enemies, but we're to pray for them. We're to, we're to look for ways that we can pray for them. So I just think about that. Like, as we think about the New Testament scriptures that, that come out, um, one of the things we see is that there's such a difference in the way that believers should act um, <clears throat> toward others, especially our enemies, those people who we maybe have hostility uh, with um, or disagreements with. Jesus tells us a couple of things in the New Testament. He says, we are... We are to love our enemy. Uh, loving our enemy means we want good for them. Uh, he says we are to look for ways to serve our enemy, uh, to meet the needs of our, of our enemy. He says we're to um, look for ways to bless our enemy. Um, we are to look for ways to serve, not to serve our, but pray for our enemies. Um, and then even be willing to forgive our enemies. Um, all of these are so different than the rest of the world, right? The world says, you're my enemy, I want to pay you back. I want to hurt you like you've hurt me. I want to seek revenge. I want to make sure you pay for your wrongs. Jesus says, no, there needs to be a different posture, a posture of reconciliation, a posture of if they have done evil and if they have sinned, 
our ultimate goal should be, can we get them to recognize that God offers forgiveness? So different than the rest of the world. Our mentality, our posture, our aim in life should not be about revenge. It should not be about getting them to pay back, but it should be about, can we get them reconciled to God? Can they get? Can we get that person who has wronged us, who has been walking us in, can we get them to know Jesus? Um, changes the game on how we per, uh, perceive people and how we respond to people as well. So think about that in your own life. Then he says in the last verse, he says in verse 48, be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. That word perfect means to be complete, to be mature. God is longing for us to grow toward maturity, longing for us to be complete in our faith where we don't have to rely on ourselves, but we rely on Jesus. Part of that reliance on Jesus in this idea, in this field of revenge and retaliation is that uh, when we reach a level of matureness in our life, um, we don't have to find revenge. We don't have to get um, justification. We trust that in time, God will deal with that. Let God deal with those kind of things. Let God deal with the people who have wronged us. We need to be faithful with what God has asked us to be and trust him with the rest of that. That is a mark of a mature believer. When you don't have to seek revenge and retaliation, um, but you let it go, you let it be what it is. Um, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to do those things before people. You don't have to worry about the image uh, that you have in front of other people. You trust that God will take care of that. You live with integrity and trust the rest of God. So be encouraged by that. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the truth of the scripture. Lord, I do pray that we would uh, grow toward maturity. We recognize that growing toward maturity means that we completely trust in you, that we leave uh, the revenge dynamic up to you, that we don't have to seek that. We don't have to wrestle with that. Uh, we just ask your blessing over those things, God, in our life. And uh, I pray that you would help us to be um, faithfully following after you. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, hope you have a good day today. Thanks for joining us this morning. Look back, look forward to being back with you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. All right, God bless.